Hello and welcome to Quarrelsome Rhinoceros Stitches episode number 40, I believe. My name is Monica. I am the host of this podcast, which is about knitting and recently more about cross stitch and sewing and wood burning than anything else. <laughs> I uh, am coming to you from Bangor, Maine, where it is hot in the only hot part of the summer, really. Um, and yeah, welcome to the podcast. Um, if you are new here, thank you so much for joining me. And if you're returning, thanks so much for sticking around and looking at my crafty projects. Today, I have a few things to share. Um, I only have about two knitting projects that I'm going to talk at any length about. Um, I do have a third knitting project that I will um, sort of wrap up for everyone because um, I did finally put buttons on my beetle sweater. So um, I wanted to share those uh, on the podcast as well. So um, I, as you might be able to tell, I'm not wearing any knitwear today because it is definitely going to be about 84 degrees, which is pretty warm for this area. So uh, no knitwear for me today. Um, I am instead wearing this lovely sunny yellow shirt um, to, and a, a nice flowy skirt because I'm about to go out and visit with my grandmother. So yeah, so today is Sunday, August 9th, and I am a week away from being finished with my summer internship and um, about a week away from having a lot more time on my hands. So I didn't get as much done as I thought I might this summer with my summer internship. When I got home from most days, I was really, really tired. So instead, I decided to take it a little bit easy on myself. I've also had a fairly um, difficult summer in my personal life as well. So. Um, so hopefully uh, things will start to even back out here and I can start the job search anew and um, the new semester is at the end of the month. So I have a little bit of time to sort of collect um, myself, my thoughts, um, and uh, start a new semester as strong as can be if I have to do all of my classes online. So, which is okay. Um, we are, the university I do go to is committed to an in-person semester, but uh, with the caveat that the larger classes are being, um, um, they're being sort of taught remotely because it's not safe to have everyone in the same room. Um, a lot of my classes are similar. They've all been been scheduled as remote instead of in person just because of the layout of a lot of the buildings makes it really difficult for us to safely meet in person so um being a really big extrovert it's really difficult for me to not have that um sort of daily campus routine so hopefully i'll be able to still um get something meaningful out of this semester and hopefully by the end of it, um, I will have learned something. That's my goal. Because last semester, I don't feel like I did. I did really well last semester, but I don't feel like I actually learned very much. So um, with the switch to remote teaching. Anyway, <laughs> um, as I said, this, pod this is a knitting podcast, not a uh, life story podcast. So... <laughs> Um, I do have a little bit of admin up front. I just wanted to um, mention once again that uh, this podcast is now affiliated with Rhinobot Studios. You can find all of the show notes over on the website for Rhinobot. I post them every single time I post an episode, and I am going to start a list of uh, episode episode um, show notes on the page for the podcast. So, um, hopefully I'll be able to get that up here pretty soon so I can have a link to each of the show notes after it comes out. If you watch this six years from now. So, um, <laughs> um, 
yeah, so all of the show notes are over there. Um, I will put a link down in the description box below. And also I wanted to mention, I did write a blog post about it and I'll link that below as well. Um, the whole Ravelry situation with the new redesign uh, affecting a lot of disabled members of the community um, has made me revisit a lot of the patterns that I've written and I'm tr basically with the intent of trying to make it more accessible. So rather than spend a lot of time being angry at the people who run Ravelry, I want to try and use that in a constructive way to take a sort of inward look at all of my patterns to see what I can improve. So I did do some layout changes to the three patterns that I have published. And most of those are more about printability than readability. I do feel like most of the patterns that are all of the patterns that I've produced have been fairly readable. I did take out a lot of the images that were embedded in the pattern themselves. I am considering revisiting the format in which I write my patterns. Um, and that's more about formatting really than anything that's in the pattern. So I'm not rewriting the pattern. I'm just re like changing it around so that it's a little bit more um, easily readable. The other thing that I am doing is offering large print versions. So um, I know it's really difficult to change the font size on PDFs. So um, I've decided to start uh, releasing my patterns both in um, a serif and a sans serif font. So for whichever one is more readable um, for you, I do know someone um, who's very close to me who is uh, who is blind. And I asked what font sizes work for her specifically and what font like name, what, what is it serif or sans serif that works for her. So I used that as sort of my guide. So she did say that serif fonts are supposed to be easier to read, but she finds it easier to read sans serif. So I just decided to do both. Um, and I believe it is between a 26 and a 30 point font the whole, on the whole thing. Um, there's nothing different about the pattern. It is just that the font size is different and I've made it a little bit easier to see some of the charts as well. So especially for the Tempest Shawl, that's the only one I believe that I have charts for. So, um, yeah, so that should theoretically be a little bit easier to read and those are accessible. If you do download my pattern, there should be three, now should be three files, one with the small print version and two large print versions, and they'll be labeled serif and sans serif. So I hope that does help. And um, if there are any other readability issues that you experience or, um, or that you think I should take into consideration when I am generating my patterns for sale, um, absolutely please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is quarrelsomerhino at gmail.com. I will try and put it up on the screen right here. So with that out of the way, um, I also, the only other admin thing I have is that I have put all of my patterns on Payhip. So I may end up stopping support for Ravelry. Um, I haven't really looked that hard into it because I don't particularly want to spend any time on the website right now and my patterns don't sell very much. That is that is the honest truth. I think I sold two copies of patterns last year uh, in 2019, the whole year. So, <laughs> um, so I am not comfortable going to Ravelry and figuring it out because I am susceptible to migraines and I don't want to trigger a migraine for myself. Um, until they have fixed those issues, I will likely not get on Ravelry. I have been on a couple of times, um, very, very briefly, but yeah, anyway. If you want more information about my pay hip, 
store or about what changes I'm making, I did write a blog post on the Rhinobot Studios website, so I will link that down in the description box below, and I will also give a link to the Payhip store directly. So, um, yeah, that is basically um, all of the admin things, I think, that I'm going to chat about this time. So, um, yeah, if um, you have any questions or suggestions or anything like that, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I am more than willing to help make my patterns more accessible um, and do the work to really help the community. That is my, that is my goal. So um, with that, I believe we will get directly into the knitting. So um, I have two knitting projects to share. The first I'm going to share are socks. Um, these are living in a Hannah Lisa Haverkamp bag. She is no longer making bags. She is one of the, um, the creative minds behind the Making Stories books. So um, these are socks for my husband. So of course they're all tangled because why wouldn't they be? Let's try and get these to some sort of viewable... All right. <laughs> so um, these are Knit Picks Felici in the 8-bit colorway. Um, it is a retired color by this point. They sort of cycle out their colors fairly frequently, but uh, that is what color it is. So it's this light gray, a dark gray, and then this sort of like limey green yellow. I can't really describe how, how you would call that color. I think it's like a yellow, but it's like a green yellow. Um, and it's sort of muted, muted green, yellow. I don't know. So there's that. I am doing them two at a time because there are 80 stitches. <laughs> uh, my husband has fairly, fairly large feet. So, uh, and legs. So I am knitting 80 stitches around on a size one, which is a 2.25 millimeter needle. Um, I am using my Chow Goo's as always. Um, Chow Goo is probably my favorite needle brand, uh, in general. So, um, yeah, so this is a two by two rib. I don't remember. I just decided to do it for about two color repeats. And then the only difference that I'm doing from a vanilla sock is that I am slipping the first, like slip, slip one, knit one on the color change all the way around and then, um, just knitting like normal. It's just nice to add a little bit of interest to the piece. Um, the last time you saw these, they were down here at the cuff. Um, I have not put very much work into them. Like I said, I haven't had very much time to knit, so I haven't really had the brain power to knit. I've been pouring my creative time into other avenues, other areas, I guess. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't share them on the podcast. So this, of course, I don't really have this in a good place to share either, do I? Oh no, I do. I am at the end of a row. Look at that. <laughs> All right. So I am still working on the rockweed shawl. I'm done with the garter stitch section that's in the center of the, of the wrap. It is a wrap rather than a shawl, really. Um, I think of shawls to be like continuously getting bigger until you bind off. This one has a fixed width, so it's, uh, I consider it a wrap. I don't know if that's sort of a, an industry standard, but that's how I've always thought about it. So this is the Rockweed wrap. It is a, um, point to point wrap. So this, you start off with about seven stitches, you increase to a specific width, and then you do some lace, some garter, another section of lace, another section of the stripe, and then more garter. Um, so it's, it's basically mirrored from, from here, it will be mirrored. I am really loving how this is turning out. This project has taken me so long. Um, I'll have to look back and see what episode I first talked about this shawl on, but there is an episode where I share the gauge swatch for this shawl. And I believe it was about two years ago. I'm pretty sure it was in 2017 that 2018, maybe it was 2017. Anyway, so this shawl has gone through many, many iterations. The pattern has already been tech edited. Um, 
and the pattern, like the lace chart has been generated for it. Um, I just haven't had the desire to knit it really. Um, and part of that was, um, and has been lately because it used to be titled the Beneath the Black Lake Shawl. And I have a really hard time separating art from artist as it comes to Harry Potter. Um, and I know Harry Potter is a really big, um, or ha has its, has its really big fans in this community. Um, and I am obviously not going to judge anyone who does continue to support JK Rowling. Um, I know it's a big part of everyone's life. I personally just have a really hard time separating the art from the artist when it comes to, um, their political beliefs. Um, or their lack of understanding, I guess. So, <laughs> um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I can provide a few links. Um, it's really easy to just Google. Um, I just don't, yeah, I don't really want to go into it. I just know that I personally can't support anything that JK Rowling has written anymore. So, um, I did decide to change the name of this shawl to the Rockweed Shawl. Um, it, it was always inspired by seaweed, so I figure that, um, like, the, the lace pattern itself was inspired by the seaweed that was beneath the Black Lake, but honestly, that just looks like enlarged rockweed, so I decided to go with rockweed, um, especially for the coloring on the, um, the colored part of the shawl. So, um, this yarn here is Little Bean Loves, and it is in the colorway Slytherin Common Room, and it is like this blue-green-yellow sort of mottled, um, variegated yarn, and then the black is just Knit Picks Stroll. Um, any fingering weight, any wool fingering weight will work for this. It would have such a lovely drape if you used, a uh, silk content, but honestly, you could use any wool, any fingering weight or four ply wool that you have, and it would still look beautiful. And yeah, so here I am. The last time you saw it, it was at the beginning of this garter stitch section. I have done three repeats of the lace pattern, and here I have about five rows of the lace. Um, so I'm going to do three repeats. I'm going to do another, um, another stripe section, and then I'm going to, um, decrease until I get to another point on the other side. So I'm really, really loving this knit. This is on a chow goo, of course, uh, again, um, you're going to get tired of me saying that eventually. Uh, it's a US six, which is a four millimeter needle. Um, I am using this on my interchangeable set. I was using it on a much, much bigger needle, but then I realized that my shorter Chowgu cable would work better for it, um, and it made me really happy that I was able to sort of switch without too much trouble. Um, it goes a lot faster when it's on the right size needle, I've found. So, just a piece of device, I guess. So there's that. That is, um, hopefully I'll be able to release this pattern as soon as I'm finished with the shawl, as soon as I block it, uh, and take finished object pictures. That is literally the only thing that is keeping me from, from releasing this pattern is that I don't have any pictures to put in the file. I don't have any pictures to share on the internet, um, unless you just want close-ups of the first half of the shawl. That's it. That would all be all I could produce right now. So, oh well. Um, gotta finish knitting the sample before you can actually knit the pattern. And it has been so long since I knit the pattern that I am just test knitting this myself. I may call for some test knitters, um, if necessary, but I honestly just don't think it will be. Um, but yeah, so that is that pattern. I'm really liking the garter stitch texture. I'm really liking the lace. Um, my next shawl that I will design is going to be a bit of a fade rather than a color block, which because I noticed most of my shawls 
most of everything I've designed is color block. And I kind of want to do something sort of fade, fade-like um, as far as the yarn goes. So um, stay tuned for that, I guess, if I can ever actually finish knitting this shawl. I've given myself restrictions, so I can only write down new patterns. I can't start knitting them until I'm finished with that shawl. So I got to get a move on. Um, so yeah, um, those are the only two knitting projects that I have. I have plenty of other projects that I've been working on, but those are the only two knitting projects that I have. Um, so I have started doing more cross stitch. We'll talk about cross stitch next. So I finished my mom's cross stitch pattern, or my cro mom's cross stitch picture. It is, says, I swear by my pretty floral bonnet, I will end you. It is a quote from Firefly. Um, I had had this um, halfway, most of the way finished for like a year and a half and didn't feel like uh, cross stitching at all. And then suddenly I got the cross stitch bug and decided I'm going to finish this finally. And so I did. So I finished it, I washed it, I mounted it, and I put it in this frame and it is ready to go to her. So luckily I kept it so that I could share it on the podcast. And this Mother's Day present that is now five years old can go to my mother. Luckily, she is fairly forgiving um, when it comes to pictures, or <laughs> presents, rather. Um, she knows how long it takes me to make things, and she um, she's fairly understanding. So it's going into its little bubble wrap and eventually I will send it to my mother, eventually. I'm also not very good at going to the post office, especially lately. Um, but with that project finished, uh, oh, I forgot to mention. So that is with DMC thread on 28 count, eight o'clock. Um, the pattern I found is just a random picture on Pinterest and recreated it um, because I couldn't find a paid pattern for it, so I just found the picture and fudged it, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was that, and then um, I decided to make my own pattern for my next project. I've started collecting animal art uh, or wildlife art on my wall um, in my bedroom because it's bare and I wanted something to put there. So. I decided that it's going to be a wildlife wall art, or art, excuse me, <sighs> art wall, and um, hopefully I'll be able to start filling it in here pretty quick. I may end up putting my little, um, my little rhino um, on there, possibly. Um, or... I'm not sure. I Right now I have a picture of a toucan and then I have one more piece of art that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes uh, that goes up there as well. And this cross stitch pattern, once it is finished, will go up there also. So I found, I used pixelstitch.net and found a picture of a monstera leaf and I made that into a pattern. So I decided I only wanted it to be four different colors and... Um, I wanted it to be about like seven by 11 or eight by 11. Um, it's going to be big, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I decided to do it on 18 count eight o'clock because I really, really didn't want to work with 28 count again. Not so soon after I finished a 28 count project because it was, it was just hard. It was difficult and it took me forever. Um, then again, the, the one that I started here has about 15,000 stitches in it. So, um, the, let me see if I can find my info sheet that I had for, so my pattern is on a bunch of pieces of paper and there should be one that tells me what numbers the colors are but it doesn't look like I have that handy right now. So, fine. 
I will have to find that because it's very important that I get it. Um, so I have four different, oh, there it is. I found it. Aha. It had just fallen on the floor. So I have made a little pocket out of my, out of my, uh, the bottom of it to hold the threads in that I'm currently working with. Now I'm using, so yeah, so it's about 16,000 stitches or so. Um, and most of them are in one color. So, um, I'm going to read out the color numbers to you, um, just so that you know what colors I'm using. Um, so it's number 320, 319, 503, and 3817. And, um, it shows you kind of a layout of the pages that you're supposed to print out. Um, and this is all like a service that is free. It's pixelstitch.net. You basically pick a picture and then it turns it into a cross stitch pattern. So, um, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to show you an acquisition and also, um, this cross stitch pad project. Uh, aha. All right. Let's see if I can turn it a little bit. There we go. So this is what I have so far. It doesn't look like much, but that's hundreds of stitches there. Um, several hundred actually. So this is the beginning of the center of the monstera leaf. This corner here is uh, the actual center of the of the project, and yeah. So the thing that I have it mounted on right now, I will actually take off the cross stitch from it, oops, from it, so that you can see what it is that I have it on. So I go antiquing with a friend of mine who I used to work with um, when I worked at the candy store. And we went to this sort of living history days kind of vibe um, thing. And um, so this is a holder for cross stitch. So it is a big floor mounted thing, big, just sort of square. I put it up against the couch. Um, usually I put it up against the front of the couch and, um, and it fits right, right close up against the couch and you mount your cross stitch on it. You can put pins or whatever on here. Usually I use this to set my pattern on, um, or like a pen in this little groove here. This front part is cork, so you can stick pins or whatever in it. Um, and it moves around fairly freely. Um, sometimes I use it to hold my phone while I'm cross stitching. Um, it is really incredibly handy. So before I was holding it, and this is a really big hoop, I was holding it and I would end up bent over my cross stitch um, thing and I, my back would hurt, my arms would hurt, um, and I needed a stand and I got this for $3. So um, I have been loving it. It has changed the game for me for sure. So those are my two cross stitch projects. I have three more projects to share and you've been able to see them this whole time. I'll start with this one. This is a pyrography, um, my, my dip into pyrography. So wood burning. Um, and it's not my first dip. My first dip was the, the second project I'll show you, but I wanted to redo the label, the logo for, Quarrelsome Rhinoceros Stitches. I did that a while ago and then I really, really wanted to wood burn it, um, to have it as a sign for when I podcast. So I've done it. Um, the only part that I'm not really happy about is it's really difficult to do really long straight lines. So, um, this bit was a little bit rough trying to get that to, to look right. Um, so I may eventually redo it, but I'm so happy with how this turned out. This is actually a watercolor, um, to tint the um, to tint the wood. And this is actually shading with the wood burning tool. So, um, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I basically put the, uh, new logo in Photoshop, um, or opened it in Photoshop, made, uh, the size that I wanted to make. And from there is how I like printed it out and put it on here. I traced it with graphite paper and then I wood burned it. And it is, it makes me so happy. So my first foray into wood burning um, was actually at our at my wedding. Um, our guest book was actually a birch slice that I had everyone sign, and I called it our guest log. Um, 
because of course I did. Um, but I would burned our names onto it and the date and I really enjoyed that process. I also would burned the coasters with the table numbers on them as well. And yeah, I just really enjoyed doing that. So I was hoping to get more into wood burning and it turns out it's really, really, really easy and I really enjoy it. So I may be doing some more wood burning, um, if time allows, basically. Um, but my first project um, was this guy here. This is a Lucanus service. He's a um, uh, stag beetle, I believe. Um, he's cool. Really, I just wanted a cool bug on my wall because I seem to be fairly interested in entomology. Um, I'm not really interested in becoming an entomologist simply because most of the money in entomology is based on ticks and I do not want to work with ticks. So, um, but yeah, so this wood burning was basically the first one I did. I did another version of him and I'm gonna show him to you right now. You'll have to forgive the command strips. This is how I hang it. So this is the first version I did um, and I liked it, but um, I chose to stain it and the stain was way darker than I thought it was. And it was really, I just wasn't entirely happy with it. So I decided, hey, there's another side of this wood slice. Let's do it again. <laughs> so instead of doing the stain, what I did was I, um, I burned the edges of the shell or of the elytra, and then I shaded a little bit, um, throughout the rest of it. I also, um, I don't know if you can see it. His little legs have little hairs on them or well, little shading parts on them. Um, but yeah, um, I really enjoy how this turned out. Um, I really, really like how this looks and I'm happy to have it on my wall. So this goes on the wildlife wall. The monstera leaf will go on the wildlife wall. I have another plan, um, for a large canvas to go on the wildlife wall once I have the chance to get that finished. So, um, I don't think it's always going to be my own art that I put up, but I will definitely be focused more on my own art than, um, than buying art right now. So, um, I do have one more, one more project to share. <laughs> and no, it's not knitting. Um, no, it's not crochet. No, it's nothing to do with yarn. Um, so a couple of years ago, I'm pretty sure that I showed you this fabric that I bought, um, because I can't imagine that I didn't share it with you. Uh, it's a Star Trek fabric. Um, that's upside down. It's a Star Trek fabric. Um, I shared this with you guys when I bought it, I'm pretty sure. I was going to make a 50s pinup style dress out of it because I thought that would be really, really cool. Um, and, and by cool, I mean really nerdy. Um, I would really enjoy wearing it. But then I have since gone up in dress size and I did not have enough, enough fabric in order to make the dress, which is a little bit sad, but Instead, I'm going to make myself a quilt. This is my first ever quilt project. I've never quilted anything before. And yet, I'm making a queen size quilt with, and I've now have eight and a third yards of fabric make, cut up into squares. And I started with just regular bolt fabric that I bought from like Joann's and uh, cut into yards. And yeah, so, so over the last three days, four days now, I have cut out and pinked the edges of 750 squares because apparently when I create or when I get into new things, I go big or go home. Those are the, those are the two options. So I'm going to share, um, I want to share the, the immense stack of, of squares. This is just the Star Trek fabric. And here are the other colors. So this is a ridiculous amount of fabric. <laughs> <laughs> there are 750 squares here at least. Uh, I think there's a couple of extras, but there are 750 squares here and I'm going to turn these into a quilt. Now, 
the idea behind the next phase of this project is I am going to piece them together. I did in Excel find a way to make colored squares that sort of mirrored themselves in the left and right half of the of the thing of the pattern and I've gone insane basically is what's happened. Um, I obsessively made the Excel sheet on the first day I started this project. I proceeded to cut out 750 squares on the second day, second, third, and fourth day of this project. Um, now the rest of it is going to go a lot slower because I'm not going to have as much time to sew as, or maybe I will, I'm not sure. My plan though is to stream on Twitch, uh, on my Twitch channel, which is Quarrelsome Rhino, um, piecing together this quilt. So I'm hoping to start doing that tonight when I get home from Belfast, but I do have a very long day tomorrow, so I may not get to it tonight, but definitely next weekend I will be uh, streaming, piecing together a quilt on Twitch. So um, I will make announcements about that on Instagram and on Twitter if you want to follow me there. All of those handles can be found below. Very helpful links all over the place. Um, but yeah, so I have I have the Star Trek fabric, which has this red, this yellow, and this blue in it a lot. Um, so I decided, let's do a red. Let's do a yellow. And then instead of doing blue, um, I decided to piece it all together sort of with the black. I'm not sure what the backing fabric is going to look like yet. I just know that the quilt top is going to be these four colors. And I actually have, I can put a picture of what, um, what it looks like on the screen so you can see what I'm working with. Um, but yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this quilt and I'm hoping that I can have it finished, I don't know, by the time it gets cold. I think that's reasonable, right? <laughs> but yeah, so I think I'm just insane and I get really, really engrossed in new projects that like it take my whole brain to do. So it took me a really long time to figure out, uh, to do the math for this project, um, to figure out how big each square needed to be, um, to figure out how many squares I could get out of the fabric that I need that I had on hand and I also spent a lot of time figuring out which size quilt I want to make and what pattern I want the, the squares to be in and it took my entire brain and I think that's part of the thing with craft projects for me is that if they take my whole brain then I am more likely to spend a great deal of time working on them. Um, there are some craft projects that I start and I put aside for years and years and years because they just don't captivate me the same way. Um, over the last few days, I time has just gotten away from me. I don't even know where they've where it's gone because I've spent most of my time cutting squares. <laughs> um, and in some ways that is good and in some ways that is bad for it helps me cope with anxiety and depression that I've been feeling for a long time and um I mean if it helps me cope in a healthy productive manner I'm all for it sometimes I spend hours and hours staring at my phone and I don't know where time has gone and nothing comes of it and I feel worse than I did a couple of hours ago because I've spent so much time staring at my phone for nothing and I would so much rather have a project like this to work on than sit around and wallow in what is depression, um, which is untreated depression. So anyway, um, that is just sort of my take on, on why I craft or, or what sort of captivates me. Um, that, and that is um, the last project I have to share. I will actually quickly this way. share the beetle sweater. Uh, and it's my beetle sweater, as I've shared many, many, many times on the podcast. Um, it is 
probably my most well-liked sweater that I've ever knit. Um, and I'm so excited to wear it this winter. I want it to be cold so I can wear my beetle sweater. Um, but I did put buttons on it recently and I thought you might appreciate a quick peek at the buttons. So I literally searched for beetle buttons on Google and I purchased them. They came from the UK, so it did take them quite a long time to arrive. Um, but now I have them. And they're just so cute. I love them. I love them so very much. Um, and they are very small, but also the, I turns out the buttonholes that I made for this sweater are also very small. So, um, there are the first couple of buttons done up. Actually, I probably will never have this one buttoned, but there is the first couple buttoned up. I really, really love how these buttons look on this sweater, and I am so ready for this sweater to be worn when it gets a lot warmer, or a lot colder, um, because I am very warm. I literally just put this on, and I am so warm. Whew. Okay. Anyway, um, I think that was the last thing that I wanted to share today on the podcast, so I believe I will leave you there. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. I hope that you um, have a wonderful, wonderful crafty day. And thank you so very much for watching um, and for supporting me and for, for everything that you do. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you again very soon in my next episode. Bye. This show is a member of the RhinoBot Studios family. For more information, including show listings, team member bios, social media links, and our community discord, please visit rhinobot.net.